Hello, everybody. So if you are a supporter of nuclear energy, um, you might be looking for arguments or videos or uh, resources to, you know, use in your nuclear advocacy. Um, and I've been looking for a lot of stuff in the recent weeks because I wanted to uh, know what it was and uh, how, how it would be better for us if we actually started using nuclear power. Because obviously for me, it's, it, it's, it's as clear as day I've been advocating for the use of nuclear, the continued and uh, uh, the increased use of nuclear energy for well over, I believe, 14 or 15 years by now. Um, but I can imagine that you may be new to the to the scene and that you want to have some uh, interesting resources that you can use. So here are the five key advantages of nuclear over any other source of electricity and heat. So the first thing uh, that I think is very nice about nuclear is that it is it, it does provide the best jobs in the world, and depending obviously uh, what your job preference is. I mean, if you're an artist, then nuclear might not be the, be the thing for you, or if you want to, you know, I don't know, uh, create uh, 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 create uh, beds or. If you're a carpenter or you're somebody who works uh, in home improvement or whatever, then this might not be for you. But if you have a, a, a technical skill or if you, uh, you know, you, you just like to work in an office or anything of that sort, then if you want to earn a decent wage, then nuclear is really a good place to look. Now, here on the uh, NEI uh, website you can see uh, a lot of quick facts uh, that that support you know this assertion that these are the best jobs in the world um, quite simply uh, if you look at the US alone uh, they, they they employ nearly a hundred thousand people uh, at nuclear power plants but also at institutes and at uh, other places that have nuclear re related uh, jobs uh, and, and if you look at the average wage that these people earned, and it's somewhere above $100,000 per year, I believe. Uh, one of the beauties about the longevity of a nuclear power plant, because if you didn't know, uh, nuclear power plants can run for 60 and even 80 years. Um, this means that the job security that you can enjoy at such a nuclear power plant is unprecedented. Uh, there, there simply isn't uh, any other uh, job out there that offers the same, uh, you know, the, the, the same stability, maybe a government job, but, but outside of, you know, barring the government, maybe barring, uh, let's say that you're a teacher or something like that, uh, working in a nuclear power plant really is uh, one of the best ways to secure a a, a, a a job with longevity. And uh, what you can also see is that for every 100 jobs that you get at a nuclear power plant, 66 jobs are created in the local community. And why is that? Well, it's, it's pretty simple. If we accept the fact that uh, the average wage in the nuclear sector is relatively high compared to the wages of other sectors, uh, then it stands to reason that these people who are probably going to live in the vicinity of the nuclear power plant, let's say within a radius of 20 miles or something like that, uh, these people can afford more. Uh, they also have spouses, uh, children, maybe family that, that move with them into these areas. Uh, they will all need services, local services. They all need to go to school or, you know, go to the baker or go to the hairdresser or whatever. So all these jobs and all these, these, these non-nuclear jobs, uh, they gain a little bit more stability simply because the nuclear jobs are present in their communities. Um, and here you can see it's it's not just nuclear engineering jobs, as you can see, uh, skilled trades. I was just uh, quipping about carpenters, but apparently carpenters are needed in the nuclear uh, energy uh, sector, masons as well, pipefitters. Um, 
I know a lot of people who work at nuclear power plants, and I once asked them because somebody told me, well, the reason why we shouldn't do nuclear power plants is because they need a lot of PhDs. <laughs> and I was talking to one of my friends and I said, how many people with a PhD do you think work here at this nuclear power plant? And he said, maybe, maybe five or 10 out of 400, because that is a tiny plant and they only have 400 employees. So, uh, I mean, yes, they do need to have some PhDs working there. Uh, also, some people with a master's degree are also uh, uh, needed, but you know the 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 brunt of the people who work at a nuclear power plant generally are around bachelor level uh you know they have a, a a bachelor's degree in i don't know mechanical engineering or electrical engineering or something like that and if you look at what everybody is planning right now all the countries who are you know trying to increase nuclear power then then you see that this is a pretty good bet if you want to have a nice future with a job. Now, the second reason why I think that nuclear power is the bee's knees is because I've been modeling uh, electricity systems, electricity grids uh, for the past couple of months just to figure out when a system would be able to... Uh, it, you know, uh, reach the demand, make sure that it can produce enough power to meet the demand of, of a certain country. And the country that I chose for this exercise is Germany. And uh, so what I got was the hourly demand data of 2023, and I also got the hourly production data for wind, uh, offshore and onshore, and solar. So first, including nuclear and any renewable heavy grid reduces cost. The first source for my claim that I want to posit for this or share with you is is is, is something that was um, shared, uh, was, was, was actually published by, uh, by uh, Sepulveda, Jenkins, and a couple of other people. And, and this, they did some modeling. And, and, and this is basically the, the, the most interesting uh, picture. Uh, let's see if we can, if we can increase this so what you see basically is that if you have a system uh that that is basically uh that that is basically made up out of solar panels and windmills and perhaps some some uh backup stuff uh, what you generally see is that the average cost of electricity rises and that's simply because you need to overbuild in order to ensure that you can, uh, that you always have power on demand. Now, when you add firm low carbon to the to the mix, which is the orange bit here, then you can see that the cost doesn't escalate as much. Uh, if you if you uh, expand your electricity producing system in accordance to how many greenhouse gases that it can emit. So I've done my own modeling here. Uh, so this is, this is the Germany uh, stuff that I was talking about. It's 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 pretty impressive because uh, this is this is a, an Excel file that breaks my computer whenever I try to uh, uh, do something uh, on it. So this is one of the most interesting pieces of the graph. What you see here is the power production and the demand in January, February, and March. And the red line, I don't know if it's, if it's very visible, but I will promise anyone who wants to see this graph uh, personally uh, can shoot me a message on Facebook or, 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 or elsewhere we, where we are in contact. Uh, and, and what you see is that the, the light or the, the bluish bit that you see at the bottom, that is onshore wind, uh, offshore wind production, then the gray bit that you see on top of that, that is onshore wind production and then you have these yellow spikes on top of the gray that is the solar power production at any given point uh, at every any uh, at every hour uh, during this uh, this this period and the purple bits that you see that is storage discharge so when storage needs to pick up the slack for you know wind and solar not being available now 
the interesting thing that I did here is what I did was I modeled uh, battery storage with a 15% charging penalty and a 15% discharging penalty. And these penalties are basically trying to account for the inefficiencies of the system. Now, I don't know whether those, uh, those figures are, are correct or not. Maybe I should impose higher penalties or maybe I should impose lower penalties. I don't know. In any case, these are the figures that I used. Now, if we, this is a system that has no nuclear in it, and, and, and this is based on Germany as it was, but I raised all the the, the, the capacities up in, in order to make sure that 100% of the time, uh, it, the demand could be met either by, you know, a combination of offshore, onshore wind, the PV, and batteries. Now, if we would add 25 gigawatts to this hypothetical, what you see, and this is the exact same scale, so I didn't change the scale on the on the y-axis, and, 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 and this is the exact same time frame, what you see is that all the spikes become a little smaller, and that's because I'm still doing the, the, the routine and I want to make sure that all the demand is met. But now I've added a base load component, so it is 25 gigawatts. What I do, what what I do is is I basically model 88% of 25 gigawatts because I'm I assume that there's always a couple of plants that aren't available at the moment. But you can still see it. It, it, it is a nice baseline component for this system that I'm modeling here in Excel. This is this is. Uh, hard enough to do so but what you what you see is all the peaks get smaller and smaller and smaller and then I go to 50% and this is again the same thing and what you see is that the maximum power production is lower but also the demand stays the same and, and yet the demand is met 100% of the time so when I go to the results, because this is a little bit of a, 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 a figure-heavy uh, element of this video, and I don't want to linger here too much. So what you see is that if you add 25 gigawatts, if you do that in increments of 25 gigawatts a time, each time you do that, the total capital expenditure that you need to build that entire system, so I, I assume a couple of pricing uh, points, uh, 1500 uh, US dollars for, for utility scale, uh, PV, uh, 1500 US dollars for, I believe, utility scale for onshore wind, 5000 US dollars for offshore wind, two and a half thousand dollars per kilowatt of battery capacity, and seven and a half thousand uh, US dollars per kilowatt of nuclear. So what you see is with increments of 25 gigawatts added, what you see is that you, you, you get, so if you add 25 gigawatts of nuclear, you win with 100 billion. So the total investiture for uh, no nuclear scenarios, 861 billion. While if you add 75 gigawatts, then it's you know, it's 759 billion. And if, if you add another 50 gigawatts, it's going to be 648 billion. Now, what is beautiful here is that when you look at the maximum power production, you go from 180 gigawatts down to 137 gigawatts down to 95 gigawatts, while the maximum demand is somewhere in the 70s. It's, it's I believe it's 78 gigawatts that you need at maximum at one given point. And what you also see is that you're using your means more efficiently. So instead of using 37.9% of all your uh, your power generating infrastructure that you build, uh, you start using either forty one percent or even forty eight point eight percent when you when you step up the nuclear portions of your uh, of of your infrastructure, and this gives us these two graphs. You simply see, okay, so the total capacity needed for one hundred percent domestic power production in Germany, based on the twenty twenty three figures. Uh, so without nuclear, you're well up to 500 gigawatts. If you add 25 gigawatts, uh, you lose 150 gigawatts of power that you need for other things. And when you add uh, another 25 gigawatts, you don't come up to 200 gigawatts of power uh, capacity that you need to have installed. And here you can see the total investment needed. That nuclear, in a sense, even makes this more cheap 
if you wanted to. So uh, here you see the two graphs uh, side by side. It's, it, it, these are the same graphs that I just showed you. This is the no nuclear scenario and this is the 50 gigawatt nuclear scenario. And you can see that the volatility is much less. You also see that the, the, the backup spikes, the, the times when you need to use backup are far less. Uh, and, and overall, adding more nuclear to your system basically makes it better. Now, before we continue, please let me know, or please let me know uh, what you think about this subject in the comments, whether I should uh, do things differently, whether you have a subject that you want me to make a video about. Don't forget to leave a like because that's important too. Uh, YouTube uh, looks at engagement, uh, comments and likes. Uh, and, and if you want to support me, uh, uh, Patreon is the place to be. You can find my link to my Patreon account uh, down below. Now, the third thing that I think is a key advantage of nuclear over any other source is that it uses the least amount of materials. Um, and, and, and there's a very interesting, um, there's a very interesting document by uh, from from the from the Breakthrough Institute, where they show how much materials are needed for uh, you know different energy sources, different electricity generating technologies. Now, the first thing that I show you here doesn't paint a very good picture for nuclear because as you can clearly see the EP1000, the EPR or the small light water reactor all use more materials than for instance a solar PV power farm. And what we are looking at here, I have to cut my hand because it says tons of material per gigawatt of capacity. So almost all of these are better than nuclear. Uh, the batteries are better than nuclear, the solar farm is nuclear is better than nuclear, the offshore wind farm, eh, it's, it's almost the same as the AP1000. Uh, and the onshore wind farm is still better than the EPR or the light water reactor. But this is when you consider it from a pure capacity standpoint. You, you build a one gigawatt nuclear power plant, the materials you put into the one gigawatt nuclear power plant obviously are going to be more than the materials you have to put into a one gigawatt uh, solar PV plant. But if we go up, so what you see here is now what, what, what the Breakthrough Institute has done is they have said, okay, how much energy is this generator going to generate over the lifetime over its functional lifetime. And then all of a sudden you see a reversal. Uh, and that's because the availability, the capacity factors for nuclear uh, power plants are much better than the, the capacity factors for solar PV farms or for onshore wind farms or offshore wind farms. And the reason for that is evident. Uh, this is what we always talk about, the intermittency, uh, a low capacity factor basically means that uh, the, the, the plant isn't producing a lot of energy a lot of the time, or basically it is producing only a little energy most of the time. And because most of these uh, technologies like solar and, and wind, they rarely, if ever, reach like a capacity factor if we look at it from a day-to-day -day perspective that is higher than 10, 15%. And, and, and the wind uh, the wind farms, you know, in a very good day, they may reach 60 or 70%. But on average, they only get capacity factors of 35%. Uh, and the solar farms, depends on where you built them. Uh, in, in my country, they don't even reach 10%. So this graph would be worse in my country than it would be in the United States, for instance. But I think that this is a very important thing that we need to consider uh, that if you look at it, material use use in an efficiency perspective uh, that that nuclear is a very a very efficient source of electricity um, so the breakthrough Institute I'm going to make sure that all the links are available down below uh, then when you look at the space you know of uh, a nuclear power plant, a uh, nuclear power plant uses far less space. Now I've got, unfortunately, I've got the, the wrong 
uh, the, the, the wrong map here. Let, 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 let me take the correct map. All right, let's see my maps. This is stuff I'm going to cut out of here. All right. So when we look at, for instance, here, Palo Alto, uh, not, not Palo Alto, <laughs> and we're going to look at Palo Verde. Palo Verde is a pretty cool nuclear power plant, which is being cooled using sewage. Um, and here you have three uh, gigawatt scale uh, nuclear reactors. Now, when you look to the southwest of the Palo Alto, uh, Palo Verde nuclear power plant, you can see quite a big solar power plant. Now, I don't know exactly how much capacity is here, um, but it's pretty, it's pretty clear that this thing here is 300 megawatts. Uh, let's see if we can see quickly uh, what it says here. Uh, don't believe that it does. I was hoping that they would have some information about about the solar plant. The solar plant here, uh, it's Mesquite Solar One. All right, so they have uh, different uh, different things there. But in any case, when you look at the the, the, the square, uh, the area that you need for this power plant over here, now uh, let me let me Google that because I really want to know the answer right now. Uh, the Mesquite, Mesquite uh, Solar uh, Project. Uh, okay, now let's see. All right, so the nameplate capacity of this entire solar field here is 515 megawatts. And if you look at the capacity factor, what we just talked about, that's uh, that's 32.3 percent, which is pretty good. And when we look at how much energy that is being generated there each year, it's 1.13 uh, terawatt hours per year. Let's let's see what the Palo Verde uh, nuclear power plant uh, generates each year. All right, so. The Palo Verde nuclear power plant has a capacity factor of 92.55%. That was in 2017. Uh, lifetime uh, is 82.8%. And the annual output is 32 terawatt hours per year. So 32 terawatt hours per year. And the other one has 1.1. 1. 1, uh, 1 point, let's see what it said. Yeah, 1.1 terawatt hours per year. <laughs> so, so what you get here is that you can see, you can, you can clearly see the discrepancy here. This large piece of land that is used for 500 and 500 something megawatts for uh, the solar power plant, and then here you have the Palo Verde nuclear power plant, which has a total capacity of uh, 3200 megawatts it's it's on a smaller footprint and it produces roughly 30 times more electricity uh, i mean there's simply no no contest here you sure we need a lot of uh, solar i'm not going to say we don't need to do any solar at all uh, but simply looking at the discrepancy here it's it's so nice that the people from arizona have put these two plants next to each other because this gives me the opportunity to show you just how uh, incredibly uh, how incredibly uh, efficient nuclear is in its space use and finally uh it requires far less grid expansions, if any. So if we look at the Netherlands, uh, in the Netherlands, each gigawatt of offshore wind requires more than 1 billion euro in, um, in investments in transmission uh, capacity. So cables going from the windmills to uh, some central hub on the sea, and which then have to be, and which then... Um, transport that electricity from that hub to the shore and this is something that many people simply don't understand uh, true if you want to build a a big nuclear power plant next to a big nuclear power plant then you probably have to increase 
uh, the, the capacity of the power lines that are taking the power away from the plant and onto the users. Uh, that's simply a fact. If you do what the Americans are right now planning, uh, you know, they want to replace the coal-fired power plants with nuclear power plants, uh, then you don't need any grid expansion. Um, but for wind and for solar, uh, you practically always need uh, to expand your transmission and distribution networks. A and what is more, because you're talking about power distribution, but also distributed power generation, uh, it basically means that you need to uh, add more capacity and more capacity and more capacity to, to the grid uh, than you would otherwise. So one of the things that you didn't see here, uh, let's see, um, when you look at, for instance, here, the, the zero nuclear um, scenario the maximum demand is almost 80 gigawatts but the max power production at, at, at one point in the year is 180.17 gigawatts so there's far more uh, there's far more supply than there is demand and, and also these 180 gigawatts you know all this capacity this is, by the way, this is not this is not the total capacity that you need, because when we look at, for instance, here the maximum power production, the, in the no nuclear uh, scenario, uh, is 180 gigawatts. But if we uh, would say, okay, what is the sum of all the power, uh, the power that power that is installed at that moment? All you need to do is this. You can see. Right, so uh, zero nuclear, you need 476 uh, gigawatts of power installed. If you have 25 gigawatts, that number drops to 334 gigawatts. And if you have 50 gigawatts of nuclear installed, then the number drops to 194. And the direct implication for this is that each gigawatt that you add to the net requires more requires more cables to distribute that power, to transmit and distribute that power. And nuclear actually makes sure that you need less of this capacity, which inherently also means that you need less cables. And believe me, trying to make sure, or trying to, you know, uh, build new cables uh, in some area is, is one of the hardest things that you can do, no matter where you live in, in this world. Uh, because you always have to go over someone's terrain, uh, someone doesn't want it. Um, in the United States, for instance, they have to make sure that they don't go over Indian reservations. Uh, in other countries, there's there are other communities that say we don't want that. So 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 this is a this is a real um, a, a real challenge uh, that you need to overcome. And the more capacity that is installed the larger the volume of transmission lines, the larger the volume of distribution lines you're going to get. So nuclear basically is uh, puts a break on this deployment. Now, congratulations, you made it to the end of another video of mine. If you're still here, thank you all for watching. Uh, you've been great. Uh, remember, leave a comment down below. Uh, press the like or the dislike button if you didn't like this video. And if you want to support me, go to Patreon, please. Thank you all for watching. I made a strong force be with you. Bye-bye.